the sun, the people, the places. I don't need to sell you on Thailand because Thailand will sell you on itself. In this video, I'm going to talk about my experience teaching in Thailand. First of all, dealing with different companies to get to Thailand, going through the visa process, actually getting my teaching certification and then teaching and living there. And I'm also going to talk about why this was the best decision I made in my teaching career. All right, let's dive in. Hello, my name is Ryan. I've been teaching English for five years and it all started in Thailand and that's why you're here watching this video. If you're new here, I offer tips to English teachers and consider subscribing if you want more content. So before we dive into this long video, I'm just going to give you a rundown of step-by-step -step what exactly happened. So the first thing that I did, I found this travel company. This travel company basically uh, helped me through the process to get my immigration documents in order to go over to Thailand. They also connected me with this education company, which trained me for four weeks to complete my 120 hour TESOL certification. After that, I was given a placement at a school and I was linked up with an education company. All right, so let's get started. How did it all begin? Well, let's rewind the clock back. It was all the way back in 2017. It was more or less five years ago that the end of my four-year bachelor's degree here in Canada was quickly approaching. And I was thinking, what am I going to do after leaving Trent University? You see, I always wanted to travel, right? I looked at those find yourself in Thailand brochures and all the cliches and all the memes and all of the people making fun of the people just like me who would go over to Thailand. And I didn't listen to any of it. I knew that it would be different when I actually got there. That no matter what I saw in that postcard or that pamphlet or that brochure, it's going to top that. And it's going to be a lot harder, but also a lot more rewarding in many, many different ways. You're traveling abroad for the first time and living abroad for the first time as a young person. It's going to be scary and it's going to be exciting. So after I made this decision, um, my family and my girlfriend of three months were completely adamant about this. Actually, my family were like so worried because I guess for them, none of them had really gone to live that far away before. They heard stories about tourists doing stupid things and getting, uh, getting in trouble over there. They really tried to dissuade me from going over there and thank God. Gosh, I didn't listen. So I have my two brothers, my two sisters, my parents, my aunts, my uncles, everybody just telling me, I don't think you should go over there, right? When you're just graduating from university, in the eyes of a lot of other people, you're still a baby. And for me to be doing all of this on my own as the first in my family was scary for other people probably scarier than it was for me. And for my girlfriend, she was just not so happy about the fact that I made this decision without chatting to her about it in the um, in advance. And that's one thing, if I could go back, I definitely would have spoken to her about this before uh, making the decision. But anyway, I trusted my gut instinct and I am so happy I did so because this ended up being one of the best experiences that I have ever had. So I spent very short time looking and researching online and basically the first salesman who made his pitch to me, I was sold. Now this person was from a travel company called Global Work and Travel Co. And basically they connect individuals with other, usually other companies, which provide the services to allow them to travel, to allow them to work. So I was on the phone with this guy asking me, you know, have you ever gone scuba diving? Have you ever wanted to, like, what are your interests? And he would find a way to kind of sell me on Thailand. He knew I wanted to go there. This guy had a job and he did his job well. And I was linked up with an employment company or an employment agency. At the school where I was teaching, this employment agency basically represented me and they were the mediator between me and the school where I was teaching. And I taught there for five months and I lived in Bangkok. And that's the video. See you later. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. Let's go from the beginning and we're going to go step by step so that you know exactly what to expect if you're hoping to go and teach in Thailand. Basically, there was a lot between the lines. There's a lot of fine print. I was told that they would pay for 
basically everything. Like I would have my accommodation paid for me. I would have my food at least for the first four weeks paid for me. I would have my flights paid for me. Things were a little bit different, however. So basically what happened after I paid the money, which I'll tell you in a second what the fee was, after I paid the money to this company, they linked me up with another representative who was like my go-to person for the next six months as I got ready to go to Thailand to make the big leap, right? So this person helped me set up a portal on Global Work and Travel Co. And on this portal, I was expected to kind of compile all of my documents in there, right? So to put um, everything I need for my visa. Um, this person, I only really spoke to them on the phone maybe two or three times throughout the entire process. But basically, they were not the ones who actually sorted all the visa stuff out for me, as I was told on the phone. These were the people who just validated that I had the correct stuff. So this portal kind of had identification and I was expected to upload a criminal reference check. And this was all so that I was able to apply for a non-immigrant visa for Thailand. This visa was a single entry visa. It cost, I believe at the time it cost $180 and it was valid for 90 days. So basically the job of this company, the reason why I paid them so much more than I had to was for them to actually just make sure that I have everything in order. But I was the guy who went to the consulate, who filled out all the paperwork, who did the application, who paid all the money for the actual application. But Ryan, didn't they pay you for the flight? No. So basically, I was told that the flight would be paid for. But of course, this is all business ling lingo. And this is one of the reasons why it's good to not go with the first company and to avoid making impulsive decisions. What they did was this. They basically found me a ticket, which is provided by one of their partner airline companies, I'm sure. And they gave me this ticket, which is m much more expensive than the cheapest ticket I could find, of course. And uh, basically, they would give it to me at a quote unquote discounted price, right? So they'd find me an ultra expensive ticket and sell it to me for like, 80% of that price, for example, instead of me just finding my own ticket, which was probably 50% of the original price. And that's exactly what I did. Went online, I found a ticket with um, China Eastern Airlines. It was $750 round trip from Toronto all the way to Bangkok with a stop in Shanghai. I had a layover for 17 hours. And then after that, I went from uh, Shanghai to Bangkok. That trip, that flight was absolutely brutal for me. It was a long time sitting down. Um, on China Eastern Airlines, I found that a lot of the people even working on the airplane didn't speak English. So I really felt like out of my kind of comfort zone. When I got to the Shanghai airport, I, um, I had to find a hotel and I was surprised by how few people actually spoke English in the Shanghai airport. But again, this was a really good opportunity for me to kind of... Uh, dive into the deep end. Um, another thing is I was petrified of catching some sort of disease from like a mosquito or a bug or something like that, because I knew that one of the last things that I had to do, or one of the first things I had to do when I got to Thailand was find a place to actually get my vaccination. I was just worrying, oh gosh, I'm going to catch something from one of the bugs just like being outside right now. And of course, nothing like that happened. There was a guy waiting there for me, a chauffeur to bring me to my hotel. Global Work and Travel Co. also got me to upload like a picture, to upload an introduction video. And the idea is that this would be sent to the education um, agency, which I'll be talking about after, which would then be sent to prospective employers for me to complete my placement. I believe I also had to, for example, you know, fill out a CV and a resume, a cover letter. So how much did this all come out to, you say? Drum roll, please. 3,100 Canadian dollars. I'll go let you convert that to your currency, but let me just tell you that was more than I had to pay. I was young and I was dumb and you live and you learn, but I'll be talking about later in this video why I don't regret this. Anyway, why do some people go with these travel companies? Well, the reason why is because 
going to Thailand to teach English, especially for the first time, it could be a little bit tricky because you need a visa really to teach. But also in order to get the visa, it's very important that you have some sort of um, offer of employment or some sort of job um, acceptance from the employer. So you're kind of stuck in this juggernaut. And what these companies do is they're able to provide you with a certificate or a letter of employment, which basically guarantees upon completion of a program, this person will be employed. And that in the eyes of the Royal Thai Consulate is actually valid. So that's one of the reasons why people do go through these companies. However, are there cheaper companies? Are there more productive companies? Absolutely. This was the same with travel insurance and health insurance. They basically told me that this would be paid for, but what they were really doing were finding programs with their partner companies or some uh, some agencies that they have a deal with and basically offering that to me at a discounted price. But again, the price for these are much higher than what you have to pay. A few things that Global Work and Travel Co. did do, they got me started, right? They got the ball rolling. Also, this money paid for my training for the first four weeks in Thailand. So the first month, um, I'll be talking about the experience in just a moment. But basically, all this money that I paid, it paid for my accommodation for that whole time. It paid for the program and the training itself. Finally, they paired me up with Explorasia, which is the next agency I'll be talking about, which was basically the education or the training company that I completed my TESOL certification with. And then that basically ended the chapter of Global Work and Travel Co. From then on, I was really dealing with Explore Asia. Explore Asia, they kind of pair travel with education, right? So one of the main things that they do is they um, help teachers come over to, to Vietnam or to Thailand, for example. They train them with a TESOL certificate. And then after that, um, they find you a placement for employment. So anyway, this chauffeur brought me into Bangkok and just immediately seeing all the palm trees, seeing all the uh, people driving scooters and tuk-tuks, seeing the, uh, you know, people playing soccer in the streets and just the absolute mayhem on the roads. It was exciting. It was really interesting. Even just looking at the way the buildings looked and the signs, I remember seeing this sign talking about how it's illegal to get a Buddha a tattoo on you in Thailand. Okay, so basically I was taken to this little hotel in Bangkok and then I was introduced to Explore Asia staff and we were to stay in this hotel for one night and then go to the city where we would complete our training. So the first thing that I did when I got to this hotel, I went and I got my vaccinations. That was done. It was very easy. Actually in Thailand, their medical system is very good compared to a lot of other countries. So I was able to go in there, kind of give them a little bit of information and I got a couple quick jabs and off I went. Clearly, I didn't learn my lesson from the first time I spent more money than I had to because, because the second day that I was in Thailand, I remember uh, going down uh, into the foyer of the hotel and they had these guys at these tables right outside of the hotel or right in the foyer of the hotel. Um, basically, they knew that we were a bunch of young, you know, pe people with money um, and they were advertising to go out to this like floating market. So I'm out there. I walk outside and uh, they start chatting me up talking to me about this floating market and uh, they told me that you know they'll pay and they'll include the admission fee yada yada and off we went I thought that this was just outside of the city like maybe 40 minutes away it turned out to be two hours away and when we got there I was expected to pay for admission so I told the guy I'm not paying for admission I mean you know we could just go back so after a little bit of disagreement here or there finally he agreed uh, to pay for the admission as he was supposed to do in the first place so I went into this floating market on this boat with these other people and 
there were just all of these like stilts and these stands on the side as you went through these different corridors in the water with people selling you, you know, they'll be selling Coca-Cola, <laughs> they'll be selling uh, different jewelry and stuff like that. They'll be selling beer. And I did this completely on my own. So from the very first day, I was like, wow, like, where am I right now? I just left Canada, home sweet home a couple days ago. And now I'm sitting in this in the sun on this boat all these bamboo trees around me and people just kind of like shoving stuff in my face it was just mind-blowing so after i got back there were these different explorasia events for people to kind of meet each other and to get to know each other before going to the city where we would complete our training so i met mainly the people who were there there were about 40 or 50 people there are mainly americans canadians brits um, a couple irish south africans australians people from new zealand they were mainly people like me people who just graduated from university who wanted to to kind of get out and travel and work and gain some valuable life experience who are mainly in their early 20s. So the next day we took a two hour uh, bus over to Hua Hin, Thailand. It's a beautiful little city. It's kind of the perfect size as well. Like it's not too large. It's not too small. I think it was only about 80,000 people. This city was also very important because we're going to learn later there are three pillars of Thai society. That's uh, the royal family or the king, the religion, Buddhism, and uh, the military or the government, right? And the king, um, the late king who had only, who had just died the year prior to me arriving there, he was actually from this city or at least his, uh, one of his residences were in this city. So this city was a very important place symbolically in Thailand. But again, Hua Hin was just perfect because it was just the, there was a beach there. There was a nice little kind of bar district. So it was easy enough to navigate without kind of getting lost. Um, there was all like all the food that you needed, all of the different attractions that you needed. There were uh, different um, excursions that we went on around the area. It, it was just the perfect size and the perfect kind of place to introduce you to Thailand. So in Hua Hin, basically... Um, it was me with about 80 other um, expats, ma mainly from the West, who were there. Um, we stayed in this hotel. The hotel had a pool. Uh, it was gorgeous. We spent the first week doing basically an orientation week. We had a seminar every day. I mean, it was eight hours a day for the whole four weeks, you know? So you could drink as much as you want at night and you could do what you want um, outside of that. But basically you were expected to be there and uh, to complete, complete all the training. So the first week was focused on orientation and really um, it, we completed this Thai culture course, which we actually received certification for. That included us uh, learning about Thailand, learning about the politics in Thailand, the recent history in Thailand, the significance of King Bumibol, who was basically um, the late king who had been very important in establishing ties with the West and also um, starting a lot of programs um, in Asia, which were very important for the development of Thailand and the agency of Thailand as a society. Um, he was very popular amongst even celebrities in Hollywood. He was he reigned, I believe, for 70 years, which made him one of the longest reigning monarchs ever. One of the first things we did when we got to Hua Hin, um, Explore Asia, they took us over to the mall and we set up our phones and we set up our um, bank account. So basically, I set up my uh, bank account with this bank called K Bank, and I set up my uh, phone with this company called True Move. I believe for True Move, it was completely unlimited um, for twelve dollars a month. So unlimited texting, unlimited calling, and unlimited um, internet, right? Which was really good. Unfortunately, the internet connection wasn't very good um, over there in the middle of Bangkok, uh, for me at least. We did a couple Thai cooking classes. We did a couple um, Thai uh, language classes as well. 
And at the end of all of this, we were able to get this certificate for Thai culture training. So moving into our second week, the second week was basically the start of our training. So this week we focused a lot on methodology and lesson planning. And in the week after that, we focused much more on um, like the pragmatics of teaching. So I guess classroom management, different teacher styles, for example. And everything moved so fast, but every day just felt like a year. I mean, you're staying in this hotel with people. I had a roommate from South Africa. He's to this date, one of my best friends. One of the guys staying across the hall, this guy from Ireland, and a guy who was staying in the room beside us, this guy from America, the four of us kind of formed our own little tribe, and uh, we actually stayed close even after leaving Thailand. So this course was very fun. I mean, a lot of the time we were able to go out at night. We went to the different markets and bought stuff. We uh, enjoyed the sun. We enjoyed the water. But at the same time, we were very very uh, serious. A lot of people were scared that if they did not show up to class, they would not be able to get their certification and then they would not be able to work. And if they're not able to work, they'd have to go back home. These kinds of nerves and stress actually led a lot of young people who otherwise would have been very irresponsible to be responsible. And I think a lot of us, if not all of us, actually were probably model tourists as far as expats in Thailand go because of the fact that we had a lot of pride in what we were doing and we knew that um, we had to show up to class each and every single day. We had to be there for the whole entire time and we had to really work and complete our tasks. I remember working with this um, with this British girl and this American girl on um, our lesson plans and actually presenting the lesson plans to the class. So a lot of the um, a lot of these two weeks, I guess the second and the third week of being in Thailand, but the first and the second week of the 120 hour TESOL, a lot of this was actually learning things from our teacher who was from South Africa, um, who had been teaching for 20 years in Thailand. So learning things from him and then basically trying to apply that to our theoretical practice and then um, presenting that to the class giving one another some feedback and preparing for our practicum. So then in the final week, the fourth week of me being in Thailand, but the third week of my 120 hour TESOL course and the last week before I left for my placement, what did we do? We had our practicum. Our practicum was basically a summer camp in uh, Hua Hin. So we went to a local school, all 80 of us or so, all of these teachers taught students for three or four days we would go into the classes two teachers at a time right so we would go in pairs and one teacher would teach and the other one would observe or vice versa and then our teacher trainers would kind of come around and just you know see how everything's going so this was my first time ever teaching Okay, ever teaching, and it was my first time teaching English. And let me tell you that this was one of the most, uh, th this was a bizarre experience because some of the classes, of course, had students who were like very well behaved and stuff, and they listened because we are edutainers. Us expats, we are full of energy, we are young, we have all these fresh ideas, and we're trying them out. But on the other hand, we don't have a lot of classroom management skills. They are not polished. Everything is theoretical and nothing has been put into practice yet. So darn, there were a couple classes where there were just, um, just paper airplanes flying around. <laughs> And like the uh, the person who I was teaching with was basically laughing at the back of class because I was not able to handle this. It was hard. It was difficult. And compared to my uh, practicum in my C Tesla certificate, which I did later in Canada, it was completely different, right? So one of the things that's really important in this teacher training is that they they train you for the context that you're going to be in. This is common in a lot of Tesla. TEFL and TESOL's 
all over, right? So they will train you the, the, for the context that you'll be teaching in. So they knew that we would be teaching in Thailand. I mean, they're the ones who were going to be placing us after all, right? So they knew we would be teaching in Thailand. We would likely be teaching children anywhere from four years old all the way up to 16 years old. They knew that we would be teaching in public schools as well. And in public schools, there will be a range from these classes that are very highly funded, very well taken care of, all the way to these classes which are completely neglected. In terms of methodology in our course, we were taught PPP, which is Presentation Practice Production. So basically you present uh, some vocabulary or present some sort of um, piece of the language. After that, you get your students to practice. They could do a worksheet or something like that. And then at the end, they produce something using that language. This all sounds well in theory. And this is what we would do in our lesson plans. This is how we would plan our lesson. Um, usually we would have a warmer at the beginning of class. We would have the PPP and then we would have a cooler. And if you don't know what those are, then just check out some of my other uh, videos. When you actually got into the classroom, a lot of this really falls apart. And that's one of the situations where you need to be flexible you need to be adaptable so at the end of this week we got our certification we graduated we had a big celebration we went to the beach we had fun we danced we partied and it was overall a fantastic experience throughout those four weeks we even went to excursions we went to mountains we went to temples we went to caves uh, we went to beaches it was a really good way to get introduced to Thailand. I did find out, however, that a lot of the other teachers who went there or teachers in training who went there, they didn't go with Global Work and Travel Co. They went with a different company called Greenheart Travel. And this company and other companies like it charge a lot less than Global Work and Travel Co. charged. So if I were to go back, that's definitely one of the changes I would have made. I would have gone with one of these cheaper companies um, than paying, you know, almost double the price. All right. So at the end of the training, in the final day, they basically started calling in all of the teachers to have a meeting with them. So people with Explorasia would sit down with us. And they would ask us, what we wanted in a placement, like what kind of placement we were looking for. So the placement would range for five months. It would be a full semester in a Thai school. Which part of Thailand do we want to go to? We had people going up to Chiang Mai, down to uh, Phuket, um, staying in Bangkok. Oh, oh, where, where would you like to go? Which age of students would you like to teach? For me, I was able to um, to secure a spot at a, uh, a place in Bangkok. I wanted to teach in Bangkok. I wanted to teach at a large school. I wanted to teach 14 to 16 year olds, right? And that is exactly what I got. So that was my placement. So the just a couple days later, they basically put us on buses and sent us to where we were going. And this is when we were linked up with the third company. And this was the employment agency. So a lot of the time when people go to Thailand or to different um, Asian countries to teach English, especially for the first time, they're going to have to go through an employment agency, whether they like it or not, unless if you've established some sort of rapport with the school beforehand. And the reason why is because this school actually pays for this agent and you take a, they take a cut out of your paycheck as well, so that this agent could be the mediator between you and the school. These Thai schools have had to deal with enough of the lack of responsibility of expats going over there to teach, right? Not showing up on time, not wearing the proper attire, not listening to the rules, leaving class early, for example. So this is the mediator. This is the middle ground. And basically, when I got to Thailand with another person who was from my same program as well, the United States, we were to be teaching at the same school in Bangkok. Um, and a representative from this employment agency, they basically were supposed to help us to find accommodation in Bangkok and to help us get started at the school where we were going to be teaching and for the duration of the time teaching there and also to help us with immigration and to help us with renewing our visas. Because remember, when I applied for the first visa, it was a 90-day 
non-resident visa. So in order for you to actually extend that visa so that you could properly work, you actually need to get a work permit as well, and then you reapply for a new visa. So that's another thing that the employment agency helps you with. One of the representatives from this agency helped us to find a place to stay. We ended up staying in this part of Bangkok called Dindang, and it was actually perfect because it was just five minute walk away from our uh, school. So we didn't even have to buy like a scooter or anything in order to get to the school. It was right down smack in the middle of a university neighborhood as well. So it was filled with you know, wherever there are university students, there are shops, facility. So there were no problems finding a gym, finding a restaurant, finding what, finding a shopping mall. So for the next four months, I was staying in a one bedroom apartment. There was bas basically a washroom and then there was just the bedroom. There was a bed, there was a balcony, there was a mini fridge. There were no cooking utilities. That's one thing that's not very common in a lot of apartments in Thailand to have, uh, you know, cooking utilities like a uh, um, like an oven or a stove because all of the food is served right outside on the street. They have 7-Elevens everywhere. So that's where you could get your food if you want some, but you could keep some food in your fridge. There was also a fan and a TV, so I was set. Rent came out to about $400 a month and that included having a cleaner come in into the room as well. That wasn't even optional, that was actually mandatory. And there was a washer on site as well. The washer took coins, um, over there they used Thai bot. There were uh, so many stands with different foods uh, like chicken wings, pad thai, different vegetables. They even serve like spiders and different insects um, on these stands as well if you want to be more adventurous or at least by my standards. And they had restaurants too where you could literally go inside and eat like lasagna or potato or whatever you want. Also, there are taxis and uh, motorbike taxis galore, right? So if you ever need to get to you know, the bar district or to a supermarket, for example, all you have to do is go outside, just throw up your hand and somebody's going to come and you could just jump on. When I was there, they didn't really have Uber. However, I believe they had a grab, but I don't know whether it was illegal or not. So some taxis would actually have the stickers on them, but it was technically illegal for these different apps to operate. You know, a thing about taking the cabs is that as long as you establish what the price is going to be before you leave, then there's no problem, right? So that's the real trick to establish what the price is going to be to where you're going, and then you're good to go. They will keep their word. You could also take a tuk-tuk, different places as well, or you could take a song tao, which we took a lot when we were in Hua Hin, right? So a song tao is kind of like this, uh, this bus with the back of it, it has, um, two benches and it has an open back, right? And, uh, that's where we usually went on excursions. But of course, if it's just you and a couple other people, you typically won't be taking a song tao. Okay, so what was my teaching experience like? Well, basically, we were called in suddenly on a Sunday. We went, we met uh, the principal, we were basically in this big open office with about 40 other teachers, maybe 30 other teachers, who had their desks in three columns, row by row. The three or four English teachers sat together, the German department sat together, the French department sat together. People were so friendly, people were so nice. It was interesting to see how people would dress because we were expected as men to wear a shirt and tie. Uh, the female teachers were expected to wear um, dresses or, or, or skirt and shirt, but it cannot be low cut. So it's quite conservative over there. It depends on how you consider conservative dressing to be. I mean, for, for me, I had no problem wearing a shirt. Also, every Monday, the teachers, the Thai teachers would actually wear this kind of like military-esque um, uniform. Being public employees, they wear these uh, uniforms, I suppose, to show their, um, to, to show that, uh, to show their representation of being part of this society, which is led by the Thai government, which was, and I believe still is, a military dictatorship. Every day started with this long ceremony, about 45 minutes. So we were expected to get to the school 90 minutes before class started. And the ceremony lasted 45 to 50 minutes. It was outside on the field. Um, and they would play the Thai national anthem. The this uh, They would sing this Buddhist uh, 
chat chant or hymn um and they would sing the uh the uh, monarchs anthem and everybody would look towards this big skyscraper this uh high-rise uh building which had a big picture of the late king on it this king was such a hero people loved this king so much by the way that after he died there was one year of mourning which me meant that all of the public service workers had to wear black for an entire year so I was teaching with a girl from America, a guy from New Zealand, and there were a couple of other British teachers who had been there for a long time who I didn't really see too much of. My schedule, I had 13 classes with um, 14 year olds and 13 classes with 16 year olds. Some of the classes were heaven, some of the classes were hell. Uh, in the first few weeks, I suppose everyone is just kind of getting used to you. They're so entertained by, uh, you know, seeing this fresh face in there, this edutainer. I remember there would be all of these different events outside. Um, and the girl who I was working with from uh, America was one of the most interesting people I have ever met. She's from Houston. She was an amazing hip hop dancer. We actually taught the students how to do this hip hop dance for um, this big uh, Christmas celebration that we ended up doing. And uh, yeah, she, she was fantastic. And I remember whenever there was an event, the staff would ask us to basically be the mascots, to pump up the student. They had this um, event called Loi Kratong, which is um, which is a uh, festival that they have in Thailand, uh, the Festival of Water. We did this parade around the school. There were all these uh, people decked out in this beautiful traditional attire, and we walked around and like danced with them. And oh, it was it was just so nice. Um, and we were always kind of the go-to people for these different extracurricular events. The day before Christmas, the, there was this big ceremony for Christmas, and even though it's it's not a Christian society. They celebrate all different kinds of festivals and traditions over there. So they actually asked me if I could explain what Christmas was in two minutes, the history of Christmas, to all of the student body, like on the PA in front of everybody. Um, and when I say everybody, I'm talking about more than 2,000 people, maybe even 3,000 people. It, it, it was really impressive and it was really scary. So I had to write something up and uh, and give this speech about what Christmas was in a nutshell. So I was expected to be there at 7 a.m. in the morning all the way to 5 p.m. at night. Most of the time I would leave early. Um, most of the time they didn't mind if you left early, but as, as long as you complete all of your work. On Wednesdays, I had gate duty. Each teacher has a day where they do gate duty, and that's basically when teachers go early. So they'll show up at the school at like 6 a.m. and they will basically greet the students as they come in. So they would give them a sawadi cap and the students will bow to you. They will give you what they call a why and you will give one back. And that's kind of just this uh, sort of respect thing that the students do to the teachers and vice versa. It's so paradoxical because it's so kind of loose and relax, but it's also very uniform and strict in a way too. In fact, right at the front of the school, when students walked in the gate, there would be a barber outside with a buzzer. And when students came in, the uh, teachers would kind of inspect to see how long the hair, the hair of the students were. And if the hair was too long, they would basically sit them down in this line and a barber would come and uh, cut their hair for them, which, which I guess is, it saves money, right? So some of these classes were fantastic. I mean, basically in the Thai system, the way it works is each year, the most academically inclined students move up one class and the students who perform the worst move down one class, right? So by the time you get these students at, you know, the 14 years old and 16 years old, you have these classes where there are 20 students who look like they're in some sort of like Montessori student uh, school. They are absolutely like, they have these clean, nice uniforms, like even the uniforms look different. And then you have these students who like these classes where it's 55 students in a class running around throwing like garbage around and 
you know, the first few weeks, it's, um, it's easy because I mean, you know, they're still interested in you and they'll, they'll like listen. But once you get to like the seventh week out of the whatever, 16 week semester, that's when it starts to get tricky. And the scariest part about it was that the, um, the agent from the employment agency is expected to come and check up on you right? And he won't tell you ahead of time. He will surprise you. So he or she will literally come ask you for your lesson plan because you're expected to have your lesson plan for each lesson beforehand. He'll sit in on the class and you'll be expected to perform. So I remember the first time this happened, I found out from my coworker that he was there an hour before. So I was able to kind of quickly whip something up together. But you know, the class started very well, the first half went well, but then it just kind of started to fall apart. Like the students, it was one of the very difficult classes, by the way. So the students, at the beginning I think because they knew that there was a monitor in there they did me a, a solid right like they were actually very well behaved but I suppose by halfway through they just kind of like lost their concentration lost their attention so I was sort of worried but you know what the agent actually said you did a great job he was really impressed with what I did. And I think that's what it comes down to. A lot of people are realistic. They know how it goes over there. They know the struggles when you're teaching in a new place and you are the edutainer. On one end, you could attract the interest of a lot of students, but on the other hand, it could be really difficult for uh, students to keep, to take you seriously and to keep their concentration. And you know, once you lose that respect from the students once you lose the discipline it's so hard to get it back right and this is one of those things that you have to learn from it right so these agents have seen it all and clearly i wasn't the worst of it all on the other hand you will have those other classes i was telling you about where the students are acting like complete angels right and then you'll have them in the middle and you know there's good on both sides right because even though some of these more difficult classes were more difficult a lot of the most wholesome honest like motivated students were in those classes a lot of them had very good intentions and they had fantastic personalities and those were the students who would say hi to me outside of class keep in mind that in thailand sometimes you'll go to school and there will be no class happening that day like they will just not have class they'll have a holiday or something like that that will happen like once or twice but also get used to the fact that sometimes they will call you like last minute to tell you about some sort of summer camp that they're doing and they want you to teach so this really depends on your school it depends on your seniority and it depends on the, the employment agency that you're with for example, the employment agency that I was with, they were pretty hands off, but they did have some problems with communicating stuff with us, especially with regards to, to getting our documents together. They also expected you to do different programs, which weren't really part of your contract. So you would get this contract and basically the pay that I got through this contract was about 1,200 Canadian dollars per month, right? Which, which was good. That's actually good living in Thailand because I mean, you know, for my rent, it was 400 and that was expensive rent for Thailand, even for Bangkok. In order for me to get a bonus of $2,000 at the end of this, I had to complete the whole semester and that's how I was able to cash in my bonus. So that's one of the things that really motivates you to show up on time to not miss days because if you miss any days then you have to forfeit your bonus. You also have to get used to teaching or working on Christmas or on New Year's even if you're not used to that. But the nice thing as I said before is that there are these celebrations revolving around these days so that kind of makes up for it. So what was expected of me from the administration? Well they wanted to see all of my lesson plans for the first uh, seven weeks and then after that they wanted me to produce all of them for the remaining seven or eight weeks. They also wanted a midterm exam and an end of term exam. For me, when I first got started, I made a lot of mistakes. I was too much of a perfectionist trying to make a lesson plan and I scratched it out and then I just didn't end up doing it. So one of the things that I suggest to new teachers is to just kind of like jump into it, just go for it and try something because I spent a lot of time like procrastinating on this. So I was making last minute lesson plans, which I wasn't very proud of. And then by the time I got to the midterm exam, I was 
I basically didn't have enough that I had actually taught the students to test them on. So that was a real mistake. So at the end of that five months, I got my bonus. I showed up for every single class, every single day. The life there was difficult sometimes. I mean, I worked hard and I played hard. Every single weekend I did something. I went to a different place. I may have taken one weekend off from all of the weekends that I was there. You know, it was a different place, a different attraction a different bar, a different uh, mall that I was going to, a different person that, that I was meeting or meeting up with. It was really incredible. And then if you have friends in Thailand, then you could go and visit them as well. So my Irish buddy, my American buddy, my South African buddy, I was going and meeting them as well. So see, these are the amazing things that you're able to do um, by living over there. At the same time, it's hard to find that work-life balance, especially for a young person, for a new person. I really got burnt out by like the 10th or the 11th week and I kind of lost a lot of my motivation. Um, so keeping that amount of gas to, you know, to take care of yourself, to actually um, do your work, but also not like party so hard on the weekend that you're completely drained. That's a real e equilibrium that you have to find. And for somebody who's like 20 or 21 going over to Thailand, that could be a little bit tricky. So you yeah, sometimes I was working on five hours sleep or four hours sleep or even less, right? Like there were difficult days, you know, you had to ride it out, right? But at the same time, that's life and that's work. At the end of it, I cashed out, I jumped on a plane and I came back uh, to, to Canada. So that's my experience of teaching English in Thailand. Here we are five years later. I would have never become a, uh, an English teacher if I hadn't gone to Thailand, if I hadn't gotten that TESOL certificate. I have other videos on my channel talking about the importance of experience, the importance of certification in some regards as well, and what it has meant to me. But overall, I would say that even though this job was the most difficult job that I have ever done, my first job, it was also the most rewarding job and the most important job that I've ever had as a teacher as well. And I'm five years into the trade. Folks, thank you so much for watching. If you would like to see more videos about teaching abroad, about teaching online, about teaching English in general or languages in general, please subscribe to the channel and let me know in the comment section below. I'm thinking about making more videos about teaching abroad and where you could go and why you should go to certain places. I like to make more videos talking about difficult jobs and easy jobs. So if you're thinking about teaching abroad, let us know in the comments. Uh, best of luck to you. I hope everything works for you. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me via email or Instagram. All the best. Keep working, keep studying, and keep smiling.